Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's event from the Jesus College Intellectual Forum. My name is Julian Huppert, and I'm the director here at the centre. Uh, and it's great to have you all here, whether you are here in person uh, in this lovely Frankopan Hall, uh, named for Peter Frankopan, who was a student here and wrote about the Silk Road, very appropriately for what we're going to talk about later, or whether you're watching us online. Um, I think we've, hit a, we've had people attending from about 130 countries, so we'll have to see whether we can add a little bit there uh, tonight. Some of you will be new to Jesus. Um, we have an amazing history, uh, dating back to 1144, when a small group of itinerant nuns were given a little plot of land by the then Bishop of Ely, which is currently the Cloister Court. That got expanded by King Malcolm of Scotland, and don't ask why the King of Scotland owned the rest of this land, he did. Um, and then in 1496, the Bishop of Ely at the time said that there were two nuns left, and one of them was rather elderly, the other was of ill fame, and so kicked them out and turned it into an all-male college, something we have since corrected. But over those centuries, we have had amazing people who have gone on to change global thinking. People like Archbishop Cranmer, who transformed religion here in this country with ramifications around the world. Thomas Malthus, whose work on population has been so important in shaping many, many countries' policies. More recently, we've had thinkers like Lisa Jardine, who was our first female fellow, but more importantly, a brilliant and inspirational scholar of Renaissance English, and also somebody who encouraged people to behave badly. She made badges for the women of the college to wear hidden away as a reminder that they should always behave badly. Uh, even more recently, we've had uh, Clean Bandit. Do anybody know Rockaby? Yeah, I'm glad there's a few people who know Rockaby. Um, they, they were all at this college. It's had well over a billion downloads around the world. So an amazing history, and there's much more I could say. The Intellectual Forum was set up more recently. Our aim is to reach outside the boundaries of our college uh, to the people of Cambridge, the people of the world, and to get amazing global speakers to come here as well so that we can hear what they have to say to make sure that we do think and learn together. So we've had brilliant speakers from for many places. We've had Helen Clark, who used to run New Zealand and the United Nations Development Programme. We've had Julia Gillard, who ran Australia, and now the Wellcome Trust. Uh, we've had Jimmy Chu. I don't think he's run any countries, but he's designed a lot of shoes for people. <laughs> um, we've had many, many people. Most of these are recorded, and if you go to our YouTube, just look for Jesus College YouTube, you can watch many, many of our past events. But tonight I'm really pleased to welcome somebody who has not only an amazingly distinguished career in their own right, but is also somebody we've had the pleasure of working with for many years. Um, we have a number of senior research associates who work with us, and tonight's speaker has done a few other things in his life, but one of those is to be a senior research associate with us here. Um, so uh, Farouk Amil has been, was a diplomat for over 35 years, presumably starting off as a secretary somewhere before rising to the, to the highest ranks as Pakistan's ambassador to Japan, to the United Nations in Geneva, to the United Nations in New York, and he served in Washington, Ankara, and Cairo. He's clearly shown a huge amount of competence in this because he's also had many other roles in addition to representing Pakistan around the world. He was chair of the G77, chair of the Organization of the Islamic Conference, president of the UNCTAD Commission on Investment, Enterprise and Development, and my favorite title, president of work on certain conventional weapons, which to me at least leaves, you know, which are the uncertain weapons. Yes. Or maybe we're finding out. Um, it's been a great pleasure to know Farouk for a number of years, actually since he first spoke in this hall many years ago now on a refugee yes. uh, discussion. It's great to have Aleftina here. But it's great to have Farouk here to talk to us about geopolitics from his experience lens and from a perspective that starts off perhaps in a slightly different place to where many of us do start. Farouk, thank you so much for being with us. It's great to have you here. Over to you. Well, thank you very much, Julian, for that rather uh, wonderful introduction. I, maybe I don't deserve it. But anyway, I, getting on to, uh, with, with the subject at hand, I was asked to do a talk, and I didn't know where to begin. And I thought, well, perhaps I should do something that is of interest to everybody, particularly when our planet is becoming more and more divided and more and more polarized, and you see the polarization taking place between countries, within countries. So I just came up, came up with this idea, bridges or walls. So uh, do we have a, a, a cooperative or a, a competing planet? 
And so as our planets become a little more hotter, as we know with climate change, and, the, and it's become crowded, and we're looking for the competition of resources and control. And I'm, I'm going to focus on the control as well. But of course, climate change, existential challenge that is that is being uh, um, uh, that that, we're, that we as a species are facing. But the other thing is not the clash of civilizations. I would uh, I would call it the clash of ideologies, where one side says, "Well, you know, we have a better vision for humanity." So I think this is a this is an issue that is that uh, that I'd like to raise in the beginning. And of course, the interventionist wars, the the relentless population growth around the planet. Of course, all of this has fueled human movement, and we covered this in other talks where, and I don't want to talk about too much about that, but about humanitarian issues and human rights that come with it. But it is a fact that um, in many countries, I think virtually every country, the rich have, have, have become richer and the poor have become poorer. And I think as a, as, as a global society, we really need to be uh, aware of, the, of, of, of this. And of course, with that, xenophobia, protectionism, or horrible things that we, we, we hear about every day. And it's disrupted the romance with globalization because we all thought, oh, the world is going to become globalized. It's going to be great. We can all trade with each other. We can all move around. But that hasn't happened in the way we all thought it would. So, but since time immemorial, I mean, humans were, as a species, we've been building walls and we've been building bridges. I did have a lot of pretty pictures and foolishly I deleted all of them and, and um, so I can't show you the kind of br the bridges and walls that we, had, that, that we had in the past. But of course the interaction through the bridge has been, uh, uh, it's been with, with soci uh, between societies across the ages and it's the cross-fertilization of ideas technology, and most of all, trade. We need to be trading with, it, with each other. We need to be move, uh, moving with each other. But of course, it's that kind of trade, those kind of bridges have also caused competition and have, uh, and have created conflict. So as the world has become more, far more interconnected with increasing speed, what has happened? The positive and negative aspects of globalization came to the fore. And it became a political issue as well. So people say, no, our jobs are being taken. Who are these people that are arriving on our shores? Why, why do I have to put up with this? Why, do, why should we be part of a, a, a larger unit? And you know, things like Brexit happened. Um, but humanity has shown that it can harness new technologies and great new technologies. And, and I know Cambridge, certainly Cambridge, and my alma mater, Manchester, uh, doing very well in the world of scientific, scientific discovery. But those technologies for the global good need international cooperation. It can't just be, well, well, I've got the technology and I'll just use it for myself. It's, it, it cannot be that way. But to promote understanding and have a beneficial value for all the global citizens, those technologies need to be shared. And they, would, are they shared behind a, from behind a wall or are they shared across a bridge? Um, so what are, the, what are the bridges? Ostensibly to connect societies physically, and to encourage movement and in both directions. It can't be the colonial experience. Building bridges has been an important purpose that by securing inclusive development across the world, the strategy anchors societies, and this is a very important point, to their home countries in hope and development. So if you, if, if you don't have that kind of development through that bridge, people will move on that bridge towards uh, what they perceive to be hope and development, and they won't stay in their own societies. It's very, very important to be focused on that. And the bridge becomes a one-way tra uh, traffic and extractive in nature, and it will collapse um, um, upon itself. Um, so what, what walls? It's not just a physical structure, and I want to make this point right at the beginning. It's a policy denying the free movement of people, of goods, and ideas. So the wall could be not necessarily a wall that you see uh, to, uh, in various parts of the world um, to prevent people from crossing over, but a wall is also visa bans, not allowing people to move freely across the planet, or uh, a ban on, um, on uh, an internet ban, or, and so, well, we can't have this side, but, uh, the, the free flow of ideas, of communication. And so these kind of walls, uh, I, I want to make uh, sort of impressed that it, it is not just a physical thing. And a tough version of the walls was popularized under President Trump. Um, and, um, uh, but he epitomized the me first syndrome. 
which and he's but he's not alone in thinking this and many many uh, politicians many societies have emulated this and said well you know, this is a, this is the way to go and we like this and uh, it gained momentum and to think and to think that that's gone away i think uh, it's a little premature so walls interventionist wars created refugee outflows and exacerbated ex existing migratory pathways Population movement, nothing new to our species ever since uh, Lucy came along, have now been become embroiled in identitarian politics. And it's led to, a, I would say, a nativist us and them. You, me, we're different. Are we? Are we really that different? And racism, I think, is the scourge of human civilization. That's reemerged in horrible ways everywhere. And the argument, but the argument for walls got stronger and more confident all the time. And... At a time when the West started looking inwards, building walls to limit the surge of the refugees and the migrants coming from all over the world, China, on the other hand, came up with a completely different strategy. And being the second largest um, um, economy already, of the, uh, um, uh, it, it, it wanted to link up in something, and I'm, I'm sure you've all heard this, the win-win, uh, the win-win uh, strategy. And the 2008 financial um, crisis acted as a prompter for these uh, new ideas and they came up with something called the Belt and Road Initiative and I do know in the West it's really you know it's not it's not favorably looked at so the su summits have been held over the years and because of COVID the last uh, they had a virtual summit earlier on and this is the only picture that survived the, uh, my sort of culling of, uh, of all the, the, the photographs. So this was um, the uh, modern reimagining, uh, re sorry, sort of the typo, reimagining of the Silk Road and uh, retreading ancient pathways that brought cultures together in the quest for shared knowledge. But was it really about just shared knowledge? It was an exchange of knowledge because people wanted to travel around and trade and meet each other and the cross-fertilization of ideas. So the BRI encompasses the Eurasian landmass. I think you all know the sea routes to, the, to Africa, the Americas, and Europe. And this many countries and organizations have signed on. So the, the idea behind this is, is to focus on infrastructure connectivity. And it's argued that the infrastructure development generates and helps over, overall growth. Although, and I will say an although, there is a, there is a, a, a narrative that, uh, that actually uh, rejects that that all this, all the dams and the roads, uh, you build more roads, you build more, uh, then you have to have more cars. But it's, um, uh, they see it, the Chinese model was to see it as a, as a, uh, uh, as a means of poverty redu reduction. And I think some, I, I could list a huge uh, uh, sort of a, a list of they've done this, they've done this. So I just thought I'd point out a couple of um, um, things, uh, travel times of uh, railways in Africa. So, um, what does it aim to do? Generate new sources of growth that have to uh, contend with an increasingly complicated and uh, at times a globally you know, fractious uh, uh, trading system. And uh, if you look at the WTO, and I'm sure many of you have been, may, may have been looking at this, how that's been stumbling along and having all kinds of problems and the politics come into and the, the, the posturing, is, it's, it's, it's incredible how, uh, how this organization continues to, I wouldn't say stumble forward, move inch by inch, move forward. But you can't have a discussion about walls and bridges without not bringing in the United Nations. So the UN has been the bridge-building global agency. It has, I mean, that's, the, that's it's, uh, it's to bring us all together. We have common purposes and global uh, development. And... There used to be the MDGs, now there's the SDGs, and sometimes there's a joke that even the SDGs will not be achieved because of uh, different priorities and uh, financial stress. So we'll end up with the MCDGs, which, which are the, they don't exist, but mid-century development goals. And I mean, this is a sort of a sarcastic way of looking at what the good work that the, the United, that the UN is trying to do. So trade imbalances, so it's really important to look at UNCTAD. UNCTAD, it's lost its, lost its uh, relevance, according to many of the Western countries. But I know it's not 1964, but we need to look at multilateralism and a collective form of development. And this is the way, perhaps, I'm not saying the BRI is the, uh, the answer to every problem, but it's at least, it's a, it seems to be a way to develop and have a global development, which is not 
neo-colonial, but we can, you know, I mean, a lot of people disagree with that. But the developing world is, has not developed. The inequalities have, just, have not just remained, but have increased, not between the developing world and the developed, but, bet but within the developing countries. And um, the national infrastructure development of any developing country within the multilateral context, and this is what the UN says through the SDGs, is it's much more brighter, sustainable, and the, but the infrastructure development and the difference here now is that it has to be cognizant of human development. It can't just be bridges and walls and infrastructure. It's got the people that live there, us. Um, we've, got, we've got to think about that. So robust implementation of the SDGs. I mean, you've heard all of this, the, the reboot of the MDGs. I mean, these are all things that we'd like to, that we, we subscribe to. We want these things to happen. And um, uh, oh, the, there you are, the mid-century development goals. But the foundation of the SDGs is, is in multilateralism, the bridge, not the wall. That's, that, that's the point I'm trying to make here. And there is a, a, a clear linkage between the BRI and the SDGs, such as, I don't want to go into so many of them, SDG 9, industry, uh, SDG 10, SDG 6, hunger, SDG 11. All of these dovetail with the, uh, with the BRI, with the Chinese initiative. And on paper, you know, it addresses many of the goals. And um, one of the things is, and I talk about this a lot, the, you can have freedom, you can have human rights, you can have democracy, but if you don't have human dignity, does any of that really matter? But by providing economic opportunities and economic rights become preeminent. So I wanted to talk about Pakistan and CPEC as a working example because for many people saying, oh, Pakistan's going to melt down and we're going to be another Sri Lanka. Well, it hasn't happened. And today, coincidentally, it wasn't planned this way. I had no idea when we picked the 1st of November. The Prime Minister of Pakistan is, has flown, is in a two-day visit to China to revive this because uh, he, he claims that it wasn't really moving in the way uh, it should have been doing in the, in the previous government. So the CPEC is uh, one of the, is one of the bridges, one of the one of the one of the bridges in this vast network, this ambitious network. But the thing to look at here is the forty five billion dollar economic uh, and development package. So at this time, Pakistan faced and it still faces an energy crisis. So economic growth, the population's growing, power outages, under, social unrest. And, but the party that won the national elections in 2013 was the party that said, we will provide electricity. So you can just imagine if you go home and you just don't have any electricity. And I remember, I remember that time. I was actually, before I left for Japan, I remember 2012, didn't have any gas, can't cook. We can't, you know, there's, and this is not just about, because the, it, the, the system wasn't there, we were not allowed to buy, Pakistan's were not allowed to buy uh, gas and electricity from Iran because of somebody on the other side of the world decided, well, you can't have this. Well, why not? So we've got all this energy on the other side, and then we've got Afghanistan in the middle, all this energy in Central Asia, and we have nothing. So when the Chinese came, came along and said, right, we're going to invest for $45 billion here, then it was, a, it was a big positive thing that they actually did. So it was the key, it's been the key driver. And it was natural that Pakistan would uh, partner in the BR, BRI vision, given this reality. So this just gives you some figures of how many countries and uh, how much investment has taken place. And one of the big criticisms uh, is that well, the Chinese come and they make money. It's like a, you know, they don't provide local jobs. It's a, they bring in people from China. Okay, but this is these are the figures. Um, they've created 244, well, nearly a quarter of a million local jobs, and this is in Pakistan. So make a mix of loans, investments, and grants, energy projects. We don't have energy. You know, it's 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 there's just not enough. Um, I mean, I went before flying from Islamabad a few weeks ago. You know, we have power outages, and we're lucky we're in the capital, so it's not as bad. But in some parts, the, you know, there, there's just isn't any electricity, and you can't just blame it on, well, they're just inefficient. It's just, we need to have this development. And um, there's other, tra you know, uh, airports, hospitals, and socioeconomic ones. There's focus on education and agricultural technology, access to clean drinking water, huge issue. Uh, in a subject in its own right. 
And then um, uh, there are criticisms. So, for example, the environmental thing. You say, well, oh, you're putting up coal power plants. You're going to pollute the planet. This is what China does. Well, only four of them. I mean, it should, in an ideal world, it should be zero. But I see Europe is moving back to coal power plants as well because of what's going on in, 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 in the European theater. So, uh, but they're renewable coal power plants, and, and they have the latest thermal strategy. Of course, in an ideal world, being a green person, I think we know we need to get rid of fossil fuels, period. But um, there's a port that was built, uh, Gwadar, and shrill accusations that this is uh, going to be a naval base. They say, oh, this is going to be a naval base. Well, it still hasn't. When I was an ambassador in Japan, the Japanese naval chief visited that. And it wasn't, you know, it's not, it's not a naval base. And it's all about development. Once you put uh, these kind of uh, um, bridges in, then jobs will follow. Um, so this is what has been, up till now, uh, $25.5 billion worth of projects completed. 85,000 direct jobs for Pakistani so far. And uh, it's uh, they are under, uh, 28 billion under f negotiation. We meet regularly, um, we meaning Pakistan and China meet regularly, uh, and they had the 11th meeting. So is it a debt trap? Is that what, this, is the, this is the biggest criticism, is it a debt trap? And, um, but the, the issue is that anybody could invest in any of the, uh, these projects, and it's China that stepped up to the plate and said, look, you know, we need to, they have a thing with the, uh, they have a, a policy towards the, the, the developing countries to the south, they identify with the, uh, with the global south. So it was the biggest uh, infusion of investment at a time when nobody, uh, the West, you know, could, you know, I, I wish, you know, Western countries have a, a, a huge footprint in, in Pakistan as well, but they weren't looking at Pakistan. So obviously, um, Pakistan went for it. So is it a debt trap? So the, Pakistan's debt is 22% of its total external de debt. Most of these are from Chinese concessional loans, interest-free uh, loans and grants. And um, for example, what, we're talking about energy. So the independent power projects, um, they secure financing on their own and with zero exposure for the, for the government of Pakistan. And so the bridge is not just about industry and energy. You have to have a trained workforce. And so 1.1 billion has been spent on vocational schools. It's been spent on uh, tech, uh, tech schools and indigenous labor skills. And I just had, I mean, I could find lots of things to say. Well, CPEC offers enormous potential boost for Pakistan's economy. So the World Bank itself has been had, had given a, some kind of a, a positive affirmation. This is not to say there are problems. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, the questions and uh, we'll obviously uh, we'll focus on um, you know, not, not necessarily the rosy picture that I'm presenting. But for example, we didn't have a metro in Pakistan. We didn't have a metro. So the first, uh, the orange line, what is the best way to cut, your, uh, to cut the carbon? Uh, well, we all read a, a very low carbon footprint. Um, it's, it's absolute per person. It's, it's one of the lowest in the world. But the best way is to get people out of cars and onto public transport. We didn't have a, an urban transportation system. So this was built. Uh, the Orange Line was built. It, it started off several years, oh, a few years ago. But out of the you know, 1,100 jobs, 95% of those are local. So when people say, oh, well, you know, the Chinese have done this. Well, if you live in Lahore, it's a massive city, and it's changed the lives of people who don't have access to uh, private cars. It absolutely has. And, and I, I'm a, a strong uh, proponent, pr personal proponent of public transport as being one of the ways forward. So it's not a zero-sum initiative. It's part of a peaceful neighborhood, energy, trade. And of course, all of this, isn't this better than tanks and guns? On, on tanks and guns, so much is spent on, on uh, 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 globally by everybody. So this is a, a better form of development for human society. And on the geostrategic stage, yes, of course, Western opposition for valid reasons. China's investments are seen as part of the largest strategic confrontation, which we read about every single day in every newspaper. And, every, and um, claims have been aired that the IMF funding to Pakistan should not be given because they're being used to pay, repay the Chinese loans. So this is one of the, uh, this is one of the um, criticisms. But I feel China and the US could actually cooperate here because CPEC and its consequent economic development, what would it do? 
it would encourage stability in the region, especially, and uh, we, we live next door to, a, 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 well, these days, almost a forgotten land called Afghanistan. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's long troubled. Uh, Pakistan has 8 million refugees originally, not down to 5 for 43 years, a developing country with limited resources. That's uh, again, that's a different, um, it's another huge subject. But CPEC, a cooperation between the two major powers and the US and the Western Alliance and China, would actually foster stability. Instead of competing, instead of putting up walls, surely this is the better way to go with it. Right. Um, some critics claim that the BRI is a Chinese economic domination plan. Is it? I don't know. I mean, people, I mean, I read so many articles without statistics. And, but its emphasis, of, uh, I see it as the BRI's emphasis is on cooperation. And, but can it be labeled as a neocolonialist project? Can it? For resource extraction, this is how it's often painted. And, um, you know, we, I mean, we can all draw our own conclusions. China is not exporting its political value system to Pakistan, which remains, and I would use the boi word boisterous democracy. It's not. So where is the Communist Party of, Ch of Pakistan, for example? Does it even exist? I mean, I think there was one once. So on the other hand, and this is the, we talked about this before, and this is not a criticism, it's like, well, and uh, having dealt with this, uh, Western countries often, uh, the, the development is linked to values. These are our values. And it's repeated ad nauseum in just about every single speech. These are our values. So the Chinese and the Japanese, for that matter, Asian values, well, you live your life the way you do, and is this yet another version of the white, the, 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 the proverbial white man's burden? You come, and, you come and tell me how to live. These are my values. And you say, well, we don't like them. It's like trying to turn Kabul into Copenhagen, whether the people of Co Kabul would even want that or whether that was even ever possible. So um, the architects uh, of the BRI, and the, the Chinese, uh, they're actually aware that they need a better branding. And this is where the struggle is in terms of who gets controls the narrative. And they, they've got to show some quick wins. They've got to show, well, we've built this, we've done this. And so that the local populations can see this and say, well, ah, oh, yes, OK, this, this development, this was the CPEC was very good for us. But the naysayers are very anxious as well. They say, well, no, they've done nothing, nothing's happened, and you're going into debt. And, um, and those results will take many years, and there's, there's no, really no benefit for you. You're, become, you're getting trapped in the debt trap. So, but it is, but it is re reinforcing the concept of an open world economy through interconnectivity. And I, I mean, I've added this that it has to be environmentally sus sustainable. But the emphasis on coal, uh, for example, within the BRI runs counter to that, to that goal, and I think that's, that's a valid criticism. But the issue here is uh, uh, accessibility, affordability, and inclusivity. And this is very important, inclusivity. So the people of that country, i.e. In, in Pakistan, are the drivers of the strategy. Nobody comes and tells us, like, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. So but what, what are your priorities? And this is how we can help. And this is how we will invest because we see uh, we want to help. Uh, we want to create a prosperous neighborhood. So multilateralism is at the very core of this concept. And it is the polar opposite of the me first. It's all about me. You know, so I'm going to look after myself. So global challenges today, and I think the younger, um, the, the younger people in the audience here and online would un obviously understand that You've got to have a collective response. You no know, one country can ever really go it alone. And that much, I mean, it's a very uh, uh, sort of, I mean, you can disagree with everything I've said, but, but on this we can all agree. So some countries are attempted to create clubs of the privileged, as if that would safeguard their interest in the long term in a shared stress planet. Well, you know, we were, we're behind this wall. We're going to be really happy. Well, how can you be when there's 9 billion people on this planet and growing? And, and the, such kind of walls, they do not offer any kind of global stability. So, um, which addresses the structural problems um, uh, and, and poverty concerns? So, the developing countries, uh, Pakistan's one of them, is correcting inherent imbalances in the trade and economic and development systems that still remain tilted heavily in favor of the, the developed, sorry, typo, developed countries. 
and there's debt, and I know the prime ministers of Pakistan, previous ones, illicit financial flows, tax evasion. You can have all these wonderful uh, places where you can go and stash your money and not, you know, legally, very legally. And, and uh, uh, I don't want to name names of certain countries that, 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 that thrive on this. But climate change, uh, the, the fourth industrial uh, revolution, uh, automation, robotics, all of these things uh, that everyone at Davos always talks about. But you can't talk about development and partnerships when protectionism grows and unfair, unfair trading systems pers persist. And in the South, we still see unfair trading systems persisting. And the, well, so often they say, well, it's not the governments are doing, it's the multinational corporations. But where are those multinational corporations based? Where do they earn and spend their money? Um, so without a, a dialogue and inclusive development with balanced non-exploitative strategies, the, this gap's just only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And, um, and it'll mean instability in those very markets that the, the industrialized North wants to profit. So if you've got companies working in, in, in the South and they're making lots of money, but those, uh, the, the lot of the, the, the average citizen doesn't improve, they all want to move North because of climate change, then wh why, wh why, would the, why would the industrialized North want to have this kind of short-term thinking? One of the goals is to anchor, and this is, I, keep, I said this at the beginning, anchor people to their homes by improving employment prospects locally. Africa, you know, the, the population is going to double by, uh, it's going to double by 2050. And climate change made it worse. They're all going to move. Uh, where, will they, where will they go? Where the traditional, uh, the traditional sort of um, uh, sustainable lifestyles have gone and where will they farm? What's going to happen? So... You've got, to, you've got to have uh, trading systems that anchor people to hope and prosperity in their own countries. You can't have a, an exploitative um, uh, sort of um, uh, a setup. Um, eventually, walls created on fear and suspicion of the other. Strategic, economic, um, sorry, there's a give way. And we all we need to look at the lessons of the Berlin Wall, for example. That's a wall. Um, China itself says, well, you know, whatever they've got, you know, you can say they've got authoritarian system in place. What did they do? They brought 800 million people out of poverty. And that's a, that's a huge feat. I mean, you can criticize a lot of what the, the society is, but they've, they've actually done that. Um, within countries, every sensible government wants to spread the national wealth um, across the country. Yes, uh, even level up. I mean, if that's ever even going to happen in... In, in, in a country, uh, a wealthy country, a, a very wealthy country like the United Kingdom. So what's the point of having an island of wealth in a sea of poverty at the national level? Um, and what would it look like? At, at, uh, what, what, what would that look like at a global level? So, um, so the societies that create the uh, opportunities through development are less likely to generate migratory and refugee movements, which ironically precipitated the walls in the first place. So the walls came about because... Um, uh, the, 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 the development is less likely to, uh, 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 is less likely to generate the migratory movements. Yes, challenges remain. And uh, the authors of the BRI prescription, no, it's not a magic bullet. It's absolutely not a magic bullet. And there'll have to be inevitable course correction. They keep doing it. And I look at CPEC. They say, well, we were doing this. We need to do this. It's not, it's, it's an effort to try to do something. And, but the general direction of bridges, not walls, is the better strategy for humankind on a hot, crowded planet? Do, what, what, do, should we put up walls or should we just go for the bridges? Um, and the walls, uh, the walls reaction to the bridge. And of course, a lot of criticism coming from the West. It said, oh, you know, debt trap, I've mentioned this. It's an exploitative venture. It's going to secure the resources of the developing world. Okay, this is one argument. But emerging from the post-Trump world of walls, the Western alliance has taken a few years to realize, well, the BRI is here. It's actually not going to, it's not going to go. So if you can't beat them, bring your own version. But there hasn't really been a version. There's been a bifurcated response. The European uh, Union came up with the global gateway and the US borrowing language, I would say, you know, build back better. I'm sick of hearing that and just in everything, build back better. What does that even mean anymore? Um, but these steps were taken in recognition of the challenge that came from the BRI. 
And would these, and I call them reaction strategies, would they have worked had uh, uh, it occurred if China had not even started its BRI? So it's dawn on the policymakers that criticism is not enough and alternatives have to be put forward. And, uh, and this is not to say, and I want to underscore this very clearly here, the Western alliance, the Western countries has maintained its uh, very important and traditional challenge, uh, channels of support, bilateral, multilateral through the IFIs. And you see how um, DFID was merged with the, uh, with the, FC, uh, with the FCO for, for stronger and more coherent policy delivery. So, of course, that, that important footprint of the West is very much there in building bridges. And, um, a rub I, like I said, it's robust and it's not insignificant in the bilateral context. But these strategies differ vastly from this broader, grander, global plan, which is multi-stakeholder, multilateral in its um, undertaking. So, points to ponder. And this is, uh, I think, I'm coming up to my time. Um, is this really a struggle for dominance of values and ideas? Or is it something bigger? Control of the global economy. Is China trying to control the planet? Is this is what uh, its critics are afraid of? And is it a battle to deliver a planetary prosperity by rival systems? An authoritarian system and a liberal democratic order coming from the West? And I mentioned this earlier on. Freedom from poverty, should this come first? Are economic rights or human rights? Of course they are. In my, in my world, I, for example, I would rather be free, for, I would rather have a house, I would rather have a job and hot water and warm, you know, a, a warm, uh, heated or cooled place than, uh, and have my economic rights first. And then once you have your economic rights, and I remember one of the South African um, leaders once telling me, saying, well, well, know your rights. So if you know your economic rights, well, I need a job. I need somewhere to live. I need transport. I need clean drinking water. I need these things. So the, my first freedom is a freedom from poverty. So China has its, I mentioned it earlier on, and it, it thinks it has a tangible model, but that's, that tangible model in their mind, it's for them. It's, within, it's, a, it's a domestic model. Can that work on the international? And this is the question. Can it work on the international level? Would it be seen as an inclusive model? Or will it be seen as an extractive model? And this is where many of the questions lie, the points to... Now, the other thing is, um, on the grander thing, win-win or victor or vanquished? Well, we had victor and vanquished in 1919. We had it in 1945. So when you look at the big picture, you say, well, should we, should we, should we be trying to include everybody, every stakeholder in the room, i.e. The, the globe, or should we say, right, well, I'm right and you're wrong, and my system is better, and you just leave no space for the other. So we have to decide as a species on this planet which way we go. So is everybody sharing the global, global resources and prosperity? Or are we going to have prosperous islands of rapid development? And outside those lovely walls, you know, you see sometimes in the sci-fi movies where all they're, all, they're living in this utopia and outside it's misery. And um, is that what we want as a, as, as a species? Um, and this is <laughs> off in a different direction. But is everything that we have ever enough? And there's a persistent need to grow, to develop, to boost the GDP. It's, it's a voracious consumption of our finite planetary resources. I mean, how long will this go on in this way? And I know I don't want to sound like someone from the Extinction Rebellion or some, you know, one of those groups, but how long will this go on? And that's why the younger people, I don't know when you're my age, what kind of world we'll have if we just keep moving in this direction of confrontation and uh, voracious consumption. So is sustainability just a buzzword? Is it? I mean, we just, I hear it all the time. It's just casually tossed in the mix. And, um, and what's, what's sustainable? What is sustainable? Like constant growth. What is, even if you've got brilliant new technologies coming online, what is sustainable about that? So we need to think about these things and how much, it, and how much is the cost to our home planet? I once read this marvelous article years and years ago. I must find it again. And it was in the, it's, it's, it was in the FT and, or the weekend section. It was about how much, how much, how much is the ocean? How, the, how much are the oceans worth on Earth? I don't know whether anybody had seen that. 
And it was, I'd never thought about it in, in that way. How much is it worth? And we just use it, you know, we can leak radio, you know, the radioactive uh, waters from Fukushima into, uh, it's safe, we, we're told it's safe. There we can dump plastics all over the world, we can do whatever we want. But how much, how much can the, our planet take with this kind of growth? And will the human need and greed to, will, will it be our undoing? It extinguishes us as a species. And so should we have, coming back to walls and bridges, a global collaborative model uh, to prevent this eventuality? Or should we just remain locked in a struggle for competing values? Or oh, my values are much better than yours, or your values are much better. I mean, this constant struggle, and you know, planet Earth is being strangulated. And in the end, and I'll, this is the last point, um, will walls and bridges even matter if we've extinguished ourselves in this whole thing? Will it really, who, what, will, what will be left if we are in this great strategic competition? So I think, Julian, I think I've come up to 45 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Farouk. And there was a huge amount there, and I feel like we could have spent an hour on each slide talking about various aspects of it. Um, so really a, a lot to really pick up on. Um, can I ask if there are any questions from people? If you can, just make it very clear where you are so that we can get uh, one of the mics to you. And I'll bring in uh, questions from online. So if you're online, if you use the Q&A feature, I'll be able to read the question out. So there's one over here, I think. <coughs> um, thank you so much for today's presentation. My name is Zudai, and I'm from Pembroke College. Um, two questions, very quick. Um, one of them is why the West is very much obsessed with uh, the BRI. Are they, do, they, do you think they have status and anxiety that, that these projects will make them step down from their um, top economic hierarchy? Can I answer that first? Yeah. yeah. Well, no, it's, it, it is, it, it, it is a, a struggle, I, in, my, in my mind, that is a struggle that China cannot become the, the, the top dog, not because China is China, it's because of the, in the West view, it's not like the West, it, i.e. it's not a liberal democracy, it's an authoritarian model, which runs completely counter to Western, traditional Western uh, uh, liberal democratic values. And that's what it, I think that's what it's about. Okay, thank you so much. Can I ask another question? Okay, thank you. Um, from your understanding of both contexts, the East and the West, do you think that, um, and personally I believe that this world is full of competing power, everyone wants to dominate, <coughs> global powers mm. want to, do to dominate. And do you think the Western uh, domination model is economic and cultural domination? Whereas the East China, you mentioned that they are not interested in exporting the communism. So do you think the Eastern model, the Chinese model is just economic domination? And the West is economic and cultural domination? Can you, can you see it that way? Well, yeah, it's, not e it's easy to sort of um, split it between the West and China, but I'll give you the example of Japan, which is not China, it's not the West, but it's the industrialized North. In my four and a half years there, the Japanese never, ever said, you take these values, these are our values. And I look at it as a, as a nation sensibility and Asian values, and they had you know, many, many similarities. They would say, we'll have economic development, we will do this on, on education, on polio. They would have all, but there was never any, any kind of cultural intrusion or uh, a sense of superiority coming from Japan. So I can look at it that way. It's not just, uh, I don't think the West wants to make every country in its own, I mean, those days are gone, I think. I mean, it's been tried and horribly failed with really tragic results. But this kind of cultural domination, I think, well, culture moves around. And I think globalization and social media have made culture far more fluid. And I think, I think Julian's going to have a, a big event on what is culture. But I hope that answers your question. There's a question up over there. So I'm really interested in how these partnerships actually work on the ground and how they're actually perceived on the ground. So, so was the experience of, in Pakistan of how the, the partnership with China is seen? Is it seen as something that is flourishing and blossoming or lots of suspicion? I'm interested in the range of different attitudes there and how yeah. that develops over time. Right. It's a very important question. And the thing is, Pakistan and China have had a very unique history. Um, as you know, when, the, when Nixon was reaching out, he went through Islamabad and, and there was this, uh, the, that rapprochement that was taking place. Every single government, whether it's been a democratic or a, a military government, um, a dictatorship, 
they've all, we, always the pa- Pakistanis have had very good re- uh, relations with China, and China is seen as you know an all weather friend because they don't interfere in the, in, in. So this is the political power structure. Yes. Yeah, what what's yeah. about more general population? Yes. Yeah, right. I'm I'm retired, so I just move around everywhere, and I hear. Sometimes a little bit of grumbling, but I don't hear widespread, oh, what are these people doing here? Why are they here? They're taking all our jobs. I haven't heard that. I personally, then you can say, well, I might just be moving in elite circles. I can assure you I'm not because I'm in all kinds of places. And I don't hear that. I've heard it. I'm not saying I haven't heard it, but I haven't heard it to the extent that it's like a, 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 a sort of a, um, a widespread resentment. As I said, Pakistan was having this huge energy crisis. Nobody was paying any attention. We'd been left with 5 billion Afghan refugees and others. And as uh, Alevtina would know, we'd had Polish refugees in 1948. So we've had the whole lot from, uh, from, for decades. But China comes along and says, right, we're going to do this. And so everybody said, great. I know we, we want this development. We want this investment. As long as somebody comes and builds the orange line, somebody comes and builds the power stations, I wanted electricity. If they're going to build them, clean ones, that is, I'm very happy. So, I hope that answers. so there's a number of questions. Can I bring one in from online, and then I'll try to go around. I think the next one is here. Um, and then uh, we'll go up to the back there and then we'll move around. Uh, but one from online from Sarah Carden, who's one, another of our research associates. Um, you mentioned that the SDGs have been criticised for being unachievable. What do you think about governments, organisations, including universities, using them as a framework for achieving sustainable development? And how do we avoid neocolonialism and encourage collaboration and multilateralism in achieving the SDGs? And can we? There's so many questions there, but the, uh, but, <laughs> but I know there. But but the governments. Are, are, I mean, the, some. I mean, it varies from country to country. But the governments are trying to implement the SDGs through national plans. I mean, this is this is, uh, and with varying degrees of, of success. It depends how much the, um, uh, the resources that particular country have. I can talk about specifically. I mean, other. I don't want to talk about other countries, although I can. But oh, let's talk about Pakistan. Pakistan was moving forward. Then we have this gigantic earthquake in 2005. Moving forward, we have a horrific flood in 2010. And as you saw on the screens this summer, what we've had. So the development goes back. And so the SDGs that you're trying to move ahead with, there's not enough money to go around. And of course, the UN itself is now strapped, cash strapped. So this has a, obviously a direct impact on the, the, the resources that are available. Of course, many countries will say, well, you, you know, you've got your budgets wrong. You need to reprioritize education, health care, access to clean drinking water over other expenditures. But that's a whole other different subject. And the second half of that was what, Julian? The second half was how to avoid neocolonialism and encourage collaboration and multilateralism in achieving the SDGs. Well, the thing is, it's, it's, uh, you avoid it by not linking it to a certain set of values. And so, well, you're not going to get any money. We're not going to help you if you don't subscribe to our set of values. And um, I don't want to, this is very sensitive ground, uh, since I'm here in Cambridge, I don't want, but we, you know, many countries would not like to have someone else's cultural experience, which is arrived at after years, decades, generations of political deliberation and political evolution to be just airdropped into a country and say, right, you've got to do this. How's that going to work? I mean, it just isn't. Many things we might come back to. So I've got over here... And then I think I said it about there, and we'll take the two over there after that. Um, yeah. Yes, um, thank you for the talk. I thought it was quite clever how you intertwined a lot of broad, general things that I think a lot of people can agree with, with a focus on a very specific thing with a lot of facts and figures, which is obviously the BRI. Mm. Can you firstly tell me why it was so much about that? And obviously, it's not especially advertised in that way on the talk. And then secondly, you talk a lot about Pakistan and China as a kind of a... a Pairing. Mm-hmm. There's no mention of India, conflict yes. in India, China, India, Pakistan. I just find that slightly suspicious. And then finally, what about the fact that you know you're saying China's not exporting culture to other countries, but it is also taken with a Im- bit of an implicit non-criticism of ch- policies taken within China. I just find that quite an interesting thing that hasn't really been addressed. No, v- very valid points. And I would say, why have I just focused on BRI? Because that I saw that as as a as a form of a bridge. Now there are other bridges as well, but I looked at BRI. I could have talked about the SDGs, just the SDGs as as bridges. But the other thing is why Pakistan? Well, because I you know I'd been working there. And secondly, if I needed to talk about 
the experience of Nigeria or Kenya or Indonesia or any other, or Kazakhstan, one of the, the Central Asian republics, then I'd need, I mean, literally, I'd have to bore you to death with a, 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 a semester of lectures because each, you can't just dispense with, with each of these uh, countries in like one line. So therefore it was, even this was, I mean, I was strapped. I mean, I tried to throw in some figures. I don't know how many people would absorb, but the idea was to show you that how many people were getting jobs in Pakistan. And uh, I mean, I could have easily have done it for another country. I think my point was more just why was it specific about a certain thing rather than the broad idea of bridges and walls, which seemed quite... Well, because I did talk about bridges and walls. Walls as a, as a barrier, which I said at the beginning, walls are not just a physical barrier. Walls are, are, are visa bans, walls are trade barriers, walls are, you know, uh, population movement controls. Walls are also well, banning, banning certain websites, uh, having a certain television uh, station closed down because you don't like it. That's a wall. So just, I mean, before we go back there, because one of the other things that you mentioned was about India, which hasn't yes. featured. I mean, you yeah. know, China has, and we could talk more about, well, all mm -hmm. of this for much mm -hmm. longer. Is there something you can say about India's role in, the, in these dynamics? Well, in uh, India, as far as uh, I understand, is, India is also part of, I didn't mention the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Now, India and Pakistan are both part of that. And if you look at the charter of what the SCO is set up for, the SCO is set up for all these collaborative ventures. And so the, uh, the, uh, you have the, you have the uh, Bretton Woods agreements, you have the IFIs all in the United States, but the Chinese set up the AAIB in Shanghai. India is very much part of that as well. So India and China have huge trade partners, absolutely huge trade partners. They have a different vision. In fact, I probably, I mean, I, I, don't have, I can't remember the figures offhand, how, many, how much trade the Indians and Chinese have, because they both need each other. So it's like Japan and China, strategically at loggerheads. Um, Japan has a different view. It's part of uh, you know, I, you know, the, the, the Western Pacific Alliance. And China is, 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 a, is, is an ideological uh, sort of um, uh, uh, competitor. But look at the trade between the two. And that is where the bridge is. The bridge is the trade. There's a question at the back. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the talk today. So what I wanted to ask is, how do you go about building bridges with those who would rather build walls with you? And yeah, without the answer of excellent yeah, diplomacy. <laughs> how do you build bridges? Well, the thing is you have to, and this is why diplomacy can seem to be, uh, oh God, they've been talking for years and these diplomats and these negotiations are just dragging on and on. But you can't give up because if you do give up and you just end up with walls, then what kind of world do you have? As a, uh, you have to keep talking. You have to find common ground. You've got to be able to find a space where, uh, well, let's say if you look at India and Pakistan, you've got to find somewhere where you can cooperate. That's where you start off with and then you move forward from that. Or any two countries that are bickering, you've got to find this, uh, the, uh, 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 the convergences rather than focusing on the divergences. But what o o often happens is because it's politically expedient to focus on the divergences because you need to win an election. So you go, for, you go for that kind, you go down that path. But ultimately, to build bridges, but remember, I, I'm making it very clear, the bridge has to be two-way, it cannot be one-way, it cannot be an extractive process, and it has to come, so if I, I have a friendship with you, if I keep phoning you up and I just get a monosyllabic response, yes, no, well, I'm gonna stop calling you. So it's got, it's got, to, it's got to be two-way, it really has to be, but the idea is some of these, uh, sometimes it takes a long time, but I don't think the planet can wait, given what we're doing as a species, what we're doing to the planet. That's the issue. So there's a question up there, and I'll do one from here and then in front of you. Thank you. Hello, um, Hi. Mona Zogby from CISL. Um, thank you for a very interesting presentation. And I think for me it also begs the question, a very basic question on the so what or the why. Why would a country invest? What is, what is in it for them? Mm. Uh, for a country to invest $45 billion in another country's infrastructure and so on, if it's not for political uh, domination or for economic interests or for cultural indoctrination and so on. What is the reason? And an interconnected question is when you were mentioning um, part of the investment is for anchoring local people in their communities and so on. But um, that also could beg the question on whether that could also be form of building a wall 
so that it's a protectionism against people, people's mobility and the freedom of people to move, but rather to keep them in their space, and when, especially when we talk about climate refugees and so on for the future. Right, so the, to answer your second part first, and that is, yes, I can see what you're saying with that, because if you, you build, a, well, you can say, well, now you, you know, you've got your jobs, you've got your employment, then you, you don't need to come here. But I think the, the reverse would happen. Once that society has attained a level of economic, economic freedoms and economic rights and a, a level of prosperity, they will come and visit Paris and London, but they'll go home because they've got, they've got, they've got live, lives and livelihoods to go back to. If they have nothing there to start with, then why would they go back? And if you perpetuate a system of unfair trading and you perpetuate a system of an extractive one-way neo-colonial project, then of course they're all going to come in. And then climate change, which most of Af well, Africa hasn't caused it, Pakistan hasn't caused it. So why should people move from the mountains into the, into the, the big cities of Pakistan? Because we, Pakistan has the largest number of um, glaciers on the planet, and we're facing a huge problem with that. So, the, sorry, your first part of the question, if you could just kindly repeat that. The why. The why. Why would they do that? Well, I, in, why would any, why, why is there, a, why is, why was DFID there? Why is USAID there? Why is JICA there? All the, the global development. Because there is, I think there is an honest yearning to help others on the planet. There are good people in every country. So there, that is definitely there. But the other thing is, why would you want to live behind a wall and there's misery and instability on the other side? We're, we're having to deal with it with Afghanistan. And so, Pakistan's development has been hampered. Why? Because Afghanistan's been this disaster for decades. People just want to leave. It's, it's a terrible situation for them there. And, um, and if you invest in, in your neighborhood, you create pathways of peace and prosperity. And of course, not everybody will be happy with it. Of course, I mean, it's not going to be like we're all automatons and we're all happy. No, it's not, never going to be like that. And certainly not in a country like Pakistan where everybody speaks their mind. And um, so there is the why is why, why, why not? Why just keep the wealth to yourself? Because then you also want to create markets to sell your goods, which you're getting at. One question from here, it touches on area we haven't really <coughs> covered. Um, uh, so somebody says, one obvious failure of bridge building is the war in Ukraine where Russia's mm. invaded. Um, what do you think will happen there? What's your prediction for the next year? <laughs> I'm the last person you should ask. I don't know. I just, I just see, uh, 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 on a personal level, I just see that the poor Ukrainians are just being put through the, the grinder for no reason. When at the end of the day, as you, you know, the bridge building, you've got, they've got to sit down and talk at some point. They're absolutely, you, I, I, I can't see a situation, or it'll just be a miserable situation that will continue. Look at Iraq. Look at Syria. Look at Libya. Are these great examples of development and, you know, uh, we have brought democracy? Well, there will be consequences. Yes, there were consequences. The consequences of misery for the, for the populations there. So when, peop when ultimately you have to come down and talk and you have to end, what about all those poor Ukrainians that have been killed? And I mean, and not just the Ukrainians, the Russian soldiers, the people in, in Donbass. I mean, there's the human beings too. And this has been going on for, well, for since 2014, but it wasn't, it wasn't a hot issue. So I don't know which way it's going to go, but I hope it doesn't, well, one thing I hope it doesn't go towards is some, uh, a sort of a tactical nuclear weapon being used, a weapon of desperation. That is really frightening. Mm -hmm. And it's frightening not just for the Ukrainians, it's frightening for everybody, as certainly here in the United Kingdom. It's the last thing people would be thinking about. Many things I'd, I, I might chip in on, but I think I'll move on to the question I said we'd take. Yeah. Um, thanks for that talk. Um, you at some point said, um, we always want more and more. It's never enough. Mm -hmm. When is it going to end? It's not sustainable. It seemed like you were describing capitalism. Do you think we should get rid of capitalism? <laughs> well, the thing is, uh, 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 have I um, thrived in capitalism myself uh, personally because it gave me freedom of choice, freedom of entrepreneurship and opportunity. It's not just a, a black picture. I think capitalism, look at, look at China itself. It's a communist society, but what does it do? It's got billionaires. It, it, it practices a form of capitalism, doesn't it? Or does it? Yeah. Right, so, yeah. so the thing is, 
until we come up with a, a, a better system, and if I, if I was a hardcore Islamist, Islamicist, and I'd say, yes, w there, is a, there is an economic for the, uh, model for the world, and it's Islam, and that's the economic model we should go with. So maybe you might like to read about that. But... Can I ask... Yes, we've got lots of questions, so we'll have to have short ones and... Yeah, short, short answer, answer, sorry, yeah. <laughs> um, so it seems like this question of is China on the rise is going to overtake the US. It's a conversation that we've had many, many times with the rise and demise of empires, and it seems to be all about the hunger for power and greediness that keeps having us in this, stuck in this cycle. And it's, it's a nice question to ask, oh, are we building walls? Or are we going to be building bridges in the future? But it seems like we're, we've always been doing both. Yeah. It seems to me that we will keep doing both, not either or. Um, unless we, if we start to build more bridges, something radically has to change. Because mm. in, in history, we've just seen like repeated cycles. Do you think that, yeah? I think you're right in what you've said, and I would agree with we've always been doing this and this pattern will continue. I'm saying that we're 9 billion people on a planet that is, is, is an existential crisis that has now come to the fore, which will affect the rich and the poor through climate change. And you have to build bridges, you have to have a common platform. And that is linked to overpopulation and unfair trading practices, amongst many other things. And, uh, and uh, weaponization of the planet, fighting wars. You know, it's just not the solution. Question towards the back there. And ask, um, what's Pakistan's role in this Ukraine-Russia conflict going on at the moment, given how America um, is not really happy with Pakistan? Are we building bridges, or are we going to cause more conflict? Well, this is a, it's, it's an important question that has been asked over and over again. And uh, former prime minister went to uh, Moscow on the, uh, on the day uh, that the, the war broke out. He didn't know. Mm, just the day before that. Yeah, he same did day, the actually. same day, yes. same day, and uh, he didn't. He he didn't know it was a bilateral visit, so it wasn't a case of supporting. And this is supporting the, the Russia's invasion. It was a bilateral visit. So people have tried to characterize that. Oh, we're we're with Russia now. No, it's not that. Pakistan is because having suffered the uh, Afghan war, having the issue of Kashmir and this whole standoff and this complicated relationship with India. We're, I think the people are just fed up of, of being involved in other people's wars. Of course, principles, our principle, like it was in Iran-Iraq war, for eight years, Pakistan was at the forefront of trying to bring those two countries together. So not that we could play the, the, a bigger role as, let's say, Turkey is playing with, uh, in this, uh, between Moscow and, and Kiev and, and Brussels and Washington. But, so, in a nutshell, what's Pakistan's stance on this whole thing? Well, don't, does not want to get drawn into this, not want to take sides. And we're saying, very simply, there has to be a peaceful negotiated settlement. Peaceful negotiated settlement, cessation of hostilities, you've got to sit down and talk. That's what Pakistan is saying. But I'm not the, I'm not the spokesperson for Pakistan. I'm a, I'm a private citizen now. I'm retired. <laughs> so, so up up on the front here. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you for your talk. Um, on your point about the IMF, potentially restricting or questioning the funding to Pakistan because it's being used to pay back debt to China. I was just wondering, um, how does a country like Pakistan go about building bridges with two countries? So for example, with like the West and with China without building a wall um, in the process of doing that because of conflicting ideologies. Because Pakistan has been part of the non-aligned movement and it's never been either or. We've, uh, Pak we, I keep saying that, Pakistan was part of CETA and CENTO, the, the, the Western alliance against communism in the, in the 50s. But it's not, it, you can be, I mean, the United Kingdom can be friends with everybody. You can be friends with France and you can be friends with Canada. It, you don't have to pick and choose and say, well, I'm your friend and I'm not going to talk to the person next to you. No, it, it, interstate relations are not conducted like that. And, it, and anybody who even tries to do that, it's absolutely ridiculous. It's foolish. So you can have friendships with everybody. And this is what... Uh, this is what Pakistan's constant drive has been to have friendships with everybody. Of course, um, every state is trying to do this. Nobody really wants to be at war unless they're, they're looking for a conquest and say, well, we want to snatch his territory, we want to do this. But um, uh, to answer your question, I, I, Pakistan wa would want 
uh, at least when I was, when I, it's, and still does, you just look at the pronouncements of, of uh, the current foreign minister going back all the way back to what Kadiaz and Mohammed Ali Jinnah said. Peaceful neighborhood. We just want to live in peace and amity. That's all. What, and just have development and we not be drawn into these unnecessary wars because I know the previous government said, well, we don't want to fight the Afghan war. Why should we be drawn into it? We're the ones who have suffered. This is what the previous government was saying. And this government is saying as well. But anyway. Um, we have lots of questions in the room and online. Um, people who've already asked something, I won't come to you unless there's, you know, we run out of other things. I hope that's all right. And if I really could ask people to be brief, that would be wonderful. So and me as right well. at the back. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if one would assume that governments have been erected to deal with needs beyond local communities' capabilities, one could say that to deal with planetary challenges like, uh, like uh, climate emergency, we would need to build uh, a planetary bridge. Um, but what I've read from your presentation is that we actually not have communities which are walling themselves, what we actually have is couple competing bridges. Um, should we wait for the emergence of the new bridge that will span across the planet, or should we actually allow the bridges to continue to compete and see which one will emerge victorious? I think um, that if we keep waiting and keep competing, we don't have a, a future as a species on this planet. It's as simple as that. It's just it, one thing. I mean, if, if there's already loose, not loose talk, but talk of even using uh, nuclear weapons in 2022, despite the NPT, despite the, the Conference on Disarmament. So when we're talking like this and you have this, all this competition going on for resources and control and our values versus your values or your values versus... It doesn't add to that climate change, which is on everybody's head. Then there's no time, or is there any time, or what kind of world you're going to, uh, are you going to have if you just keep competing? Of course, there will be competition. There has to be competition, but it has to be a competition in a, in a form that is not destructive for the planetary resources, and it doesn't exhaust. So instead of you spending all this web, all money on the weapons, and you're spending money on and uh, on multinational corporations who are extractive in nature. I'll give you, I won't mention which, I'll give you one example. A water bottle company, it's one of the three sisters. So what does it do? If um, they will take the water from the resource, uh, from, this, uh, from the ground, put it in a plastic bottle, a plastic bottle and it's single use plastic. They recycle it once. It's polluting a developing country. Where do, uh, the royalties go to a, a wealthy European country, let's say, I won't name, I don't know which one I'm talking about. And what it does, they have a cozy cohabitation with the elite of that developing country. I can drink that plastic, well, well, uh, that mineral water out of that bottle. When, and, and the elite will not fix the water system for the masses. So that's, that's not the model to be working with. I mean, I'm trying to put it into, I hope that answers your question. There's a question right at the back there, and there's a couple more here, and I've got a couple more I want to put <coughs> online. So. Uh, thank you, and you rather neatly illustrated what I was going to come to in a way. Oh. And I'm not sure I can articulate this properly, but the, I'm wondering whether it's too early to tell what the consequences of the BRI are going to be. Yes. Because unlike the Americans, who've often been very explicit we're providing the aid in order to open the country for our yeah. businesses. We have seen already in, in I think it's Kenya, where um, Chinese uh, uh, businessmen have taken over farms and run them as effectively exploitative enterprises. It was, it was very clearly reported, I think it was about two or three years ago. I'm not saying it's happening widely, but are you sure it's not going to follow as a consequence of this? And is it is it something we can actually tell? Well, I'm, I'm not a, a spokesperson for the Chinese government nor for the Chinese Communist Party. Um, well, nobody knows, and I did mention on, uh, on one of the slides that they are cognizant of the fact that they need course correction. You always, you know, you come up with a plan, you try to build something, and um, situation change. You, you've got to be flexible enough or at this point, one point, you say, well, we're going, we will shelve it. It's not, just not going to work. But in this case, it's been coming along for quite some time. And so, as I said at the beginning, the, the, the Prime Minister of Pakistan is in China, just coincidentally in China today to have a, maybe a course correction or a revamping, I wouldn't say, of, of, the, of the CPEC projects. But um, 
uh, it's uh, it, it is too, it's obviously it's too uh, too early to say because it's uh, the these projects stretch out into the into the um, into the uh, horizon, and that is why when the criticism comes forward, they say, "Well, hold on, let's see what they do." And if they haven't done it, like the M like the MDGs didn't achieve anything, and we went to the SDGs. Uh, well, they did achieve something, but they they provided the foundation for the SDGs, and they, you know. So I don't know. I mean, nobody really knows. But why, uh, why sort of say, well, we don't want it because if we think it's, uh, it's, it's colonial domination. We need to have something. We've got to have... And if the power plants are being built, that orange line, the train system goes in, all of these projects, are, you can see them. So when you can see that kind of development, the average citizen, I think somebody asked, what, are the, what, what does the common person think? Well, the common person can see these things, and that's what's changing. And that's why, but it's not, you know, it's not, it's not a perfect situation, but it's not a horrible one either. Um, um, this actually leads to, to a question from Ben Wheeler online. I'm not going to get to all the online questions, unfortunately. Just to be clear, is there political pressure on Pakistan and other countries who benefit from this investment from BRI to then support China on the world stage with votes in the UN and other ways like that? Is, is there that very simple relationship? It could be for some countries, but certainly for Pakistan, it's, as I said, it's never been like that. Pakistan's been friendly with China ever since uh, the People's Republic came into existence. There's never been a period, even when C2 and Centre, Pakistan's always had a, a very good understanding and a relation. It's, look, look at the, ge the ge geography of the area. Iran is there, okay, which is a good relations with Iran. Afghanistan, which is a, it's a, it's a, it's a huge crisis for the Afghan people, first and foremost. India, we still haven't sorted out uh, um, the, the, you know, the post-colonial agenda. We have Kashmir there. So there's one country that borders to the north, and they're, you know, they're moving ahead in terms of economic and, and uh, industrial development. So why wouldn't Pakistan have good relations with them? And, and the thing is, it's not like they're telling us, oh, you have to become communist. You have to follow our authoritarian. Our system is better than yours. Never said, I've never said that. So that's why that relationship has survived, because there's no, there's no lecture, there's no moralizing, there's no oh, there's white man's burden that comes with that kind of economic development. So I, I do want to fit these. Can I just ask one question from me? <laughs> All right, OK, you know, so, of course. Uh, um, so as you may remember, about three and a bit years ago, we hosted an event here, um, which you were in the audience for, from Michael Mandelbaum, who's an American mm -hmm. foreign policy expert. And he takes a rather different perspective, as, mm -hmm, of course. as was clear then. Um, he talks about the 25 years where there was largely peace on Earth and then talks about the problems from uh, Iran, Russia and China. And at the time, he called for a neo-containment strategy. He was worried about China becoming more aggressive. He was worried about Iran. And he suggested that Russia might invade somebody. So he's got, got that right, at least. Um, what would you say to that that says, look, it's great to try to build bridges, but sometimes they, don't, they aren't going to work? Mm -hmm. And you need a wall. Well, you need a bridge to get over a river, but you also have flood defences. Right. But the thing is, uh, answered not to you, but to the gentleman that you've quoted, how many... Uh, again, I don't want to sound like uh, the spokesperson for, the, for, for the, uh, the PRC. How many military bases does China have around the world? How many? That will tell you what their agenda is. How many military bases do, uh, does China's strategic competitor have? I mean... I would answer it as simple as, as simple uh, in that way. Of course, it's a whole lot more complicated. So, does does China have an imperial agenda? Should its should its naval fleets be floating around in the Pacific? So, if if uh, uh, American ships can be off the Chinese coast, then why can't the Chinese ships be off uh, San Diego? Well, in international waters, of course. Why not? Why shouldn't they be floating around? I mean, why? I mean, that's what the Chinese are asking themselves. So if you're going to come into my neighborhood, then why can't we come to yours? So. I'm not going to try and answer these. This is no, I don't know either. I don't know. I don't know either. But that's what um, maybe they're asking. There was asking. somebody towards the back who was waiting. There was somebody at the front who was waiting. And then I think that may be the final one over there. So. Was there not somebody there? Great. No. Then we'll go. I think there's a young oh, lady here. This lady here. And there's yes. a gentleman over there. The, yeah. And then there. And then there. Thank you very much. Uh, just building up on a couple questions that have been asked. So um, are there any terms and conditions of the investments and grants or anything that China is investing in Pakistan? Of course, of course. A lot of, uh, lot of terms and conditions, completion dates. And uh, there are, uh, of course, look, and this is to answer that young lady's question as well. If the terms and conditions, 
then they are making money. Many of those corporations are, pri are, are, are Chinese corporations and not all necessarily government corporations, but they are making money and there is an ob objective to invest, to, to do business. And if that business brings uh, investment and jobs and skills enhancement to Pakistan, then it helps. I mean, so it's the same thing as Big Pharma. So Big Pharma is going around developing countries, investing, nobody said a word. You know, I had, I had to take all these medicines and you look on the, sm on the, you look on the, uh, on the small print, awaiting a, a FDA approval. And I remember back in the 80s, awaiting EEC approval. So in other words, the people of the South were guinea pigs. And so obviously they were making money, but there was no huge, you know, people weren't getting their whatever in a twist. Uh, over this, but at the same time, China is obviously they, 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 there is an incentive. There has to be an incentive for them. There are the national projects as well, where the Chinese government is working. But of course, there are corporations that are there to make money. Yeah. Um, so we'll take very quickly at the front there, and then at the back, and then I think we'll have to stop there, or else we could go all night. People are welcome to <laughs> carry on all night informally, but <laughs> so, and quickly the, if, I, if we can. So at the global level. The units of negotiation are nation states. So nation states population vary from <coughs> under 100,000 to more than a billion. Mm -hmm. And every state claims to absolutely represent their people, um, which is very, very seldom true, even in democracies. So, and at the same time we have uh, global companies which are becoming more powerful than governments. So the question is, um, what is the future of the nation state? And can we progress without redefining such uh, artificial boundaries? That is a deeply important and philosophical question. I would say that would be, would form another, um, another seminar or a discussion in its own right. I don't know. I absolutely, I mean, I would think, like everybody in, in this room, is the nation state crumbling? But I, don't, I, I, I see the reverse happening in many ways. Identitarian politics have, uh, have re-emerged. And even within societies, well, I'm Scottish and I'm English, uh, you see this happening. I'm Basque or I'm, you know, from, uh, what's the, uh, Catalonian. You see all, and you look at the former Yugoslavia. You see all of, much more of, much more of that is happening rather than the nation state dissolving, I see the national identities, unfortunately, if you look at it from the globalization perspective, becoming stronger. The identities are, are, are becoming stronger. So, um, but yes, the multi, but if you have small little states competing with a gigantic global corporation, they can't, I mean, they get pushed, to the, they get kicked to the curb and it's very difficult. And that is why the smaller countries have to get together in coalitions to take these people on at the United Nations, not at Davos. So, That's a big very final quick question, <laughs> I hope. It had better be. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, one, one thing that China's good at, it seems to me, is, is recently has been able to produce cheap um, solar technology, mm. wind technology, um, which could solve a lot of developing countries' problems, even, even to get to the point of producing green hydrogen, say. Um, is that something that it not be better for China to do that rather than, rather than to build fancy highways and potentially uh, a metro line? Would that not be a better way of getting China you're, to help? You're right. That is also going on. But you ask, uh, you ask the, peop the, the majority of people in Lahore, it would take them s people to travel three hours a day in one direction and a great expense. Once that metro line went in, it changed the working lives of poor people. Absolutely did. And I personally believe that a public transport system should not be run as a, you know, for profit. It should be a public utility, you know, access to good transportation. Uh, equal act, transportation is a, is, a, is a basic human and a working right. So when you talk to people in Lahore, they're also happy that this, this line is there. It hasn't affected the rich. The, the wealthy, as you know, they've got big homes, but it's the poor people. It's changed the way people even work or move uh, go shopping, and it, people don't have access to cars. It has really, really changed it. Yes, solar energy, absolutely. New technology, the, the, you know, it's not just China. But Pakistan is, uh, is sort of working with, as are other developing countries, working with the developed countries as well. Germany, the United Kingdom, United States, Japan, 
Absolutely, all of this is, this is, this is taking place. But when, the, let's say, the Western Alliance looks at China, well, the Chinese are there, we don't want to go there. Well, why not? Pakistan never closed its doors, and I'm sure other countries, I don't know, I can't speak for every single country, on the, on, on, a developing country on, on, on the face of the earth, but why not? Because the idea is to get things up and running. Why not? Why not bring other people in, and why not have these, the clean, uh, the clean, uh, we need it. We're actually, I mean, we're at, at COP27 in, in Sharm el-Sheikh, this is exactly what we're talking about, the, the, uh, the the government delegation is going to be speaking about this. And I think most government delegations are going to be talking about mitigation. We want help. I mean, the South wants help in terms of building all of the things you just mentioned. Farouk, thank you no. very much for speaking about so many different That's subjects in a very place. complex area. <laughs> um, we've spoken on and off for many years about all sorts of things. And, and as you know, we agree sometimes, we disagree sometimes. Mm -hmm. But what I've always been fascinated in the conversation, I've always learned something uh, about facts and perspectives, and I'm always grateful for it. So thank you for taking the time to be with us tonight. No, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope you'll join us for more events. We have lots of varied things coming up. Our next event uh, on the 16th, we're talking about another controversial subject, abortion, and whether it should be made legal in England and Wales. Many people don't know that it's not uh, legal at the moment. Uh, slightly less controversial, perhaps. We're then talking about boy actors in early modern England. And then we're going to talk about uh, immigration and the hostile environment. And there's much more to come after that. So hopefully see you again soon. But thank you very much for being with us tonight. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.